Hi, this is Andy and Sharon McClellan from Father's House. Welcome to this teaching session. We pray that you will be blessed and grow as a result of listening today. So Father, we just bless Sharon this morning, Father, with this message that she's got in her heart. Yeah, Father, Jesus. we bless the word of the Lord oh, that comes out, the scriptures Lord. that come out, that Ooh. there'll be fire on them, that hearts would be impacted, lives changed, and forever have an encounter that sure. just changes the perspective, changes your life forever. <laughs> so we just bless Sharon as she brings bless the word you. of the Lord right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. Come on. Woo! Come on. Squidge you into the middle here. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, online to Father's House this morning, our online church here. Um, it's going to be a great great morning together i'm just going to share it myself here onto my page if i can get off the one i'm on and share posting perfect there we go Woo! yeah so let's get the word out this morning if you're on here live on facebook share it to your page and um, wherever you're watching from, let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to know. We just want to welcome you this morning. And uh, good morning, uh, Nigel Lewis, um, Andrew Miles, Maggie McClelland. Welcome this morning. It's good to have you on with us this morning. I'm just going to uh, find my, my bits on here. Where do I find them, baby? Where are they hidden? Behind. Behind. Oh, yes. Oh, there they are. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. So um, I want to, I we've been away all, all weekend. We've had a really crazy, crazy, crazy busy week. So I was like, Lord, I don't know. I haven't had time to really sit with you and prepare. I've prepared for everything else this week, but here we are. We're, we're here to teach and we're here to bring the word of the Lord this morning. Whoa, let's feel the spirit of God, actually. It's come on. And um, so I'm like, Lord, what do you want to bring this morning? And he says, I want to talk about the divine exchange. I want to talk about a divine exchange. So we have had a divine exchange. Yeah, we've been brought from darkness to light. We know, we know that. But there's so much more that has happened in that divine exchange. There's so much that we've been given and that's been removed. And we've had an exchange of um, because we are now kingdom people. So that's what I want to um, bring a little bit and share a little bit of this morning. So I want to speak firstly on the fact that we have come from being sinners you know i'm just a sinner saved by grace no yes and no you are a sinner saved by grace but you're no longer a sinner you're no longer a sinner you're redeemed and you're forgiven you're redeemed and you're forgiven so if we go to colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 if you've got your bibles there you can turn to colossians chapter 1 it's in the new testament in the middle of the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And this is what it says. It says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means that we are forgiven. We are forgiven. There's a word there that says the dominion of darkness. That word dominant, it means to, so something to be dominant. It means the power to rule or govern over. The power of him whose will and commands must be submitted to by others and to be obeyed to have the power and influence over another and to remove their power of choice, of privilege or influence. It's quite powerful. The power of their choice, their privilege or influence. So when, when we were part of the kingdom of darkness, we were under the dominion of darkness 
which meant that the powers of darkness had the power to influence you and to remove your power of choice, of privilege and influence. They had complete control over you because it's called, it's a dominion, it's a dominant thing in your life. What was it that dominated you? Darkness, the dominion of darkness. Darkness is the, the, the partial or total absence of light. And it is the forces or beings of spiritual darkness that rule in that place. So we have the we have been rescued from that the the controlling forces, the controlling beings in spiritual realms that bring the darkness over our lives, that cause us to be under the command and to submit to their will and to be obeyed, that they had the power to influence you, they had the power to control you, to control your choices, your privileges and your influence. But, but, hallelujah, we have had a divine exchange. We have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the son that God loves in whom we have what? So we've been transferred from a dominion of darkness into a different kingdom, the kingdom of the son of uh, the kingdom of the son that God loves. So we are literally been rescued from one place into another. And in that place, we have redemption. We have the forgiveness of our sins. What does redemption look like for us? For those of you that don't understand redemption, it's really, really simple. It's the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or the clearing of a debt. It's being saved from the consequences of slavery due to sin, evil, or error. So we were held captive because of sin because of evil and because of our errors, because of our choices. And now we've been redeemed, we have been bought back. What were we bought with? We were bought with the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, with his blood, with his sacrifice, with his suffering. He paid our debt in every shape or form. There's nothing that he didn't pay for. He covered everything, hallelujah. He literally covered everything in my life and everything in your life. There is nothing that he did not pay for. He redeemed you and he brought about a forgiveness of sins. So for him to forgive you, for him to, to forgive you and for you to know that you're forgiven, that was a total, total pardon from all punishment. A total pardon from punishment. Yeah, a total pardon from punishment. So many believers still think that God is up there with the big stick waiting to beat them over the head if they do something wrong. But the Bible says to me, we have the forgiveness of sins. We have been redeemed. And forgiveness, that word forgiveness means to be pardoned from punishment. We get what we don't deserve. We deserve freedom. We deserve punishment, but we get freedom. It is absolution, absolution, like someone standing in the dock of a, a jury of a court and they're a murderer or they're a thief and a robber or whatever, and they've been given complete absolution. This happened at the trial of Christ where um, Barabbas was brought out and they said, who will we let go and who will we put the punishment upon? And they all said to crucify Jesus and Barabbas was let go free. Barabbas was given what? Absolution. He was set free from punishment for Christ came and took his place also. So it, it's an action taken to totally release an individual from the consequences of their actions, to release them from sin, to release them from evil and to release them from wickedness. So when we've been redeemed, when we've been forgiven, there's no place in our lives for evil. There's no place in our lives for wickedness. There's no place in our lives for sin. It's been paid for. You've been, you've been brought out of 
that that ear that place where that happens into a new kingdom, a kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Son of Christ, the kingdom of the Son of God. So that's part one: is that you have come from being sinners to being redeemed and forgiven. Number two, number two, you have come from being condemned to loved and unpunishable. I love that. The fact that you're unpunishable. Oh my gosh. It is like, are there consequences for actions? Yes. But does God work on a system of punishment for those that he loves? Well, let's look at it. So Romans chapter eight, you've got your Bibles there. Romans chapter eight, verses one and two. Romans eight, one and two. Therefore, why? Because Christ overcame the law of sin and death. He brought a new law, the law of grace, the law of redemption. He brought a new covenant in with people. So because of that, therefore, there is now, it is activated right now, whatever, wherever you're watching and you don't know Christ, this is activated for you right now. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Come on. This is like really, really good news. It's really good news, people. Therefore, let me read that again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. You do not walk in condemnation. You have, there's no condemnation on your life right now. If you're in Christ Jesus, you have been set free from the law of sin and death. You're no longer under that law. You're no longer punishable by that law because you're now under the law of the spirit, which brings what? Which brings life, which brings life. It has set you free. There's freedom for you. If you don't know Jesus today and you're still in that old thing of punishment and sin, you need to give your life to Christ today. You need to say, do you know what, Jesus? I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to live under condemnation. I don't want to live with the fear of punishment. I want to give my life to you today. I surrender to you today. Forgive me for my wickedness. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for the things that I've done to others. Forgive me, Lord, for standing as a sinner before you. And I give it to you right now. I surrender my life to you. Come and live in me. Come and live in me. Be my Lord. Be my master. I surrender to you, God. I surrender. Come fill me with your spirit that sets me free from the law of sin and death. And I choose today to step in to that law of freedom, the law of the spirit that brings life to me. I receive life today. I receive life today in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus. Amen. If that's you, please let us know. Please let us know that that's what you've done today. We would love to hear from you. So let's look at that. Therefore, there's now no condemnation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. This is what it says. This is what it says. This is powerful. This is powerful. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear has to do with punishment, with punishment. I remember as a little girl um, pinching one of like my mom's, uh, they're called melting moments, little, little biscuit buns with cherries in the middle. And, and I was so peckish and I went and snuck one and she found out, she found out. And um, she said, just you wait until your daddy gets home. Well, was I scared? Yes, I was. Was I scared of punishment? Oh my gosh, yes, I was. I didn't feel the love at the time. All I felt was the fear. I was like, I knew like I was going to get throttled whenever he got home um, because I had taken without, without permission. Um, so for us in Christ, what does it look like? Christ says there's no fear in love, that we can approach him without fear. Why? Because punishment has been dealt with. Christ took our punishment. So punishment, fear casts out. Perfect love casts out all our fear. And who is perfect love? Jesus Christ is our perfect love. Jesus Christ is our perfect love. He like 
loves us. He knows us. This is the thing, you know, like he knows you. He knows all about you. He knows what you're like when people don't see you. He knows what you get up to when people aren't around. He knows what you're watching and what you're reading. He knows, yet he says perfect love, that perfect love of his that paid for all those, all that stuff in our lives, casts out all our fear so that when we come to him, we have no fear of punishment, but we receive acceptance and forgiveness and we just continue that walk of redemption with him. So to be condemned means to be sentenced according to the acts committed. And, and we know, we know ourselves what we deserve, don't we? We know what we deserve, yet we are unpunishable. We're unpunishable because the law that was set against you to condemn you can no longer condemn you because you are someone, because someone else accepted your punishment and stood in your place. And the beauty of that, the beauty of becoming a slave, the Bible says we become slaves unto God. What it means is that you, you reap the benefits of holiness and righteousness and freedom and joy and kindness and patience and all those things we receive in place. So that was number two. That was condemned from being condemned to the divine exchange of being loved and unpunishable. That's so powerful, you know, so powerful. So number three, you've come from being sinners to being holy ones, being holy ones. Romans 6, verse 6. Let's look at that. And, verse six, and chapter 6, verse 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and verse 22. And this is what it says. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. But now you have been set free. Woo, come on. And have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. My gosh, we were crucified. When Jesus died on the cross, we died with him. When Jesus was baptized into that grave, we went down with him. That's what it says. It doesn't say that we die now. We, we died when we got saved. It says that our old self was crucified when? With him. With him. He knew right back then who was going to say yes, who was going to surrender. He paid the price right back then. So our old life, our old sin life was actually crucified right back then, paid for absolutely dealt with when we went when he went into the grave we went into the grave when he was baptized into death we were baptized into death when he rose from the dead we rose from the dead that's why it says that we reap the result of eternal life we reap the result of eternal life not just because we decided to get saved but because he died right back then and we died with him he was buried and we were buried with him and when he rose we rose with him Come on, this is like so powerful. It was done back then, but action today, done in eternity and actioned in time, powerful. So we reap the results in our lives, which is holiness, something that we don't at off, often don't feel that we are, but yet God sees us as perfect. You know, he looks at you through eternal eyes. He looks at you as the finished product. And that's how he speaks over you. He speaks over you according to how he sees you finished and perfected. Whoa. So you've come from being a sinner to being a holy one. Being a holy one. Number four, you've come from being slaves to sons and heirs. Romans 8, 13 to 17. Romans 8, 13 to 17. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Hello. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For those that live by the spirit of God are children of God. 
You have come from being a slave to the dominion of darkness to being a child of God. And the spirit receive, the spirit that you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. But the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Come on. And by him, we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with your spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. The Lord never promised that it was going to be easy because we're living as aliens in a different world. We are of a different kingdom. We are citizens of a different family, but we are living in a fallen world that is becoming the kingdom of our God and King. Where does the kingdom dwell? It dwells in us. We are the sons. We are the heirs of God and the co-heir with Christ. You know, I remember Leif Hatland speaking on sonship. And he said, you know, there's many ships that you can sail in. There's the worship, the fellowship, the friendship. But he said, unless you first have the sonship, all those other ships don't line up and they don't function in a healthy way. We have to really remember that our foundation is being sons and daughters. Our identity is in being a son and a daughter. My identity is not in being a teacher or a prophet or anything like that. My identity is that I am a daughter of the King. I am a daughter of the Lord. I am an heir and a co-heir seated with him in heavenly places, ruling and reigning, having authority and power to cast out fear and to break off chains, to open eyes and cause the lame to walk, the blind to see and to release captives and prisoners in, in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who we are. We are citizens of a different kingdom. We are sons and sons mean that we walk in inheritance an heir is a person who's got legal entitlement, legal entitlement to the property and possessions and rank of another person on their death. Of another person on their death. When you think that God has given us the position of inheritance, that if something happened, not that it would, but if it did, that actually each one of us is entitled to the property of God, the possessions of God, and the rank that he carries if something happened. That's how valuable you are to the Lord today. That's how much he trusts you with his kingdom. That's how much he trusts you with one another. And that's how much he trusts you with the lost. And just thinking of Emma going out to the Ukraine um, at the weekend, you know, and, and God trusts her. He trusts her with kingdom. He trusts her with the broken because she's his heir. She's his, his daughter. And she carries the authority and the ring and the robe and the shoes of that position. So whenever she steps into that land, that authority is established in that place. The rule of God is established in that place. As she takes her sphere of influence into Poland, into Ukraine, she takes on authority in that realm that she didn't have before. And she releases, she releases kingdom in that place that will set captives free. Where, where is your sphere of influence today? Where are you called to operate? in your rank of air. All of you, each of you listening today carries a ring of authority, the mark of sonship. Each of you carries a mantle, a robe that says, I belong to this house. Each of you carries the shoes that's given to take authority into the marketplace, into the schools, into families, into different nations, what, what realm, what sphere of influence has God given you 
to operate in your in your in your position as an heir, as an ambassador, as a son or a daughter today. And what has he asked you to do in that in that sphere of influence? What is it that you're called to do? So number five, you've gone from being of the flesh to being of the spirit. You were born of the flesh, but now you have been reborn and you're now a spirit being primarily, not a flesh being primarily. Originally, you were a flesh being primarily, but now you're a spirit being primarily. So let's look at that. John chapter three, verse six. John chapter three, verse six says flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You were born of flesh, but the spirit has given you rebirth of the spirit, born again of the spirit. Romans 8 verse 9 says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. Do you hear me? Are you listening? Hello. You are not in the realm of the flesh. You are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So my question to you today is, does the spirit of God live in you? Do you have the spirit of God in you? If so, you do not live in the realm of the flesh. You should not be living in the realm of the flesh. You should be living in the realm of the spirit. What does that look like? It is a kingdom realm with a kingdom perspective, kingdom rules, kingdom principles, kingdom promises. That is where you dwell. That is where you live. That is where you execute your days from not from the place of the world, the place of the flesh. The flesh is crucified. So let me just read that again. You are not in the realm of the flesh, Romans 8 verse 9, but are in the realm of the spirit. You are in a different place of authority, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So a realm, just to clarify that, a realm is a territory which is either visible or invisible, over which rule or control is exercised. A realm is a territory, visible or invisible, over which rule or control is exercised. It is something that is dominant. It is an atmosphere. It is an atmosphere. So you are called to operate in the realm in the territory, the visible and the invisible, to have rule and control, to have domination in the atmosphere of the world today through the kingdom, through the realm of the spirit. Yeah. So that was number five. You've gone from being flesh onto spirit. Number six, you've gone from being a stranger to God to being a member of his house. Come on, being a stranger to God, to being a member of his house. John 14, 2. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? So just put your hand on your heart and just say, thank you, Lord, that you have prepared a room in your house for me. Thank you that I am a member of your house. Thank you that I am your son, I am your daughter, and that you have a place for me. I declare and decree today, God, that you have a place for me in your house, that I am a member of your household. Hallelujah. Amen. Number seven, you've gone from having a futile mind to having a sound mind. OK, gone from having a futile mind to having a sound mind. This kind of blew me away whenever I was when I was looking at it. So there's a couple of scriptures. Romans chapter one, verse 21. Romans chapter one, verse 21. And it says, for although they knew God, so they knew God, they knew about him. It actually doesn't mean that they knew him intimately. It means they, they knew God. They knew about him. They knew uh, this was his people, um, who he was, how they should be with him. So it says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor did they give thanks to him. But their thinking 
because of that became futile and the foolish, their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, so let's look at that again. Romans 1 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So that word futile is the word, word mateyo, mateyo, and it means to become foolish morally or wicked. To become foolish morally or to become wicked, to become vain and to fall into error. The word for mind, where it says futile mind, that word for mind is the, the word for mind that is dialogismos, dialogismos. And it means the mind that doubts and the mind that mulls over and over and over. Okay, so what the Lord is saying here is that although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. They didn't thank him as God. They didn't talk to him as God. And because of that, their minds started to mull over foolish and foolish things morally. They've started to mull over wickedness. They started to mull over things to do with vanity and their self-image, their self-gain. And it caused them to, to fall into error. So it caused them to have a doubting mind where they began to doubt God. And in that place of doubting, they began to turn over in their minds the things of the flesh and the things that they began to fall morally. They became foolish morally. They became vain. They became wicked and they fell into error. The foolish heart. So it says um, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The foolish hearts, that word for that two word together, foolish hearts, is scotizo. And it means that they became confused. Their vision became blurred. It became darkened. They were deprived of light. They were covered in darkness. Oh, my gosh. This is the end state of the man, of the heart of a man who does not acknowledge God or stay in relationship with God as God or glorify him and thank him. For me, this was a massive, a massive thing that that just the revelation of that that came to me of how the price that God has paid for our sonship, the price that he has paid for us to be members of his house. Yet, yet, if we do not love him and acknowledge him and be thankful for him, but take the glory for ourselves, our minds start to become foolish. They start to become blurred and confused and they start to become darkened. The light of God begins to go. We start to become covered in darkness. Everything becomes blurry and we begin to, to look at the things that are around us, the things of the flesh, the things that other people have that we don't have and all that kind of stuff. And we begin to fall morally, ethically. We become wicked. We become vain. And we end up falling into error. And I don't want that, that to be the end state of my heart. You know, I, I want to I make sure that when I come to stand before the Lord, that I know him, that, that we're one, that, that I've acknowledged him and thanked him, that my mind is protected. It says, set your mind on things above, not on things beneath, on things that are pure, on things that are holy, on things that are good. So the divine transfer that you received, it redeems you from the darkness. It redeems you from the confusion and establishes you in a new realm, even in your thinking, even in your thinking, not just positionally before God, but it establishes you even in your thinking. There's a divine transfer as you acknowledge God as God, as you worship him and adore him, as you give thanks to him. There's a divine exchange of, of the light of God increasing in your life, the lack of confusion established in this new place of kingdom. There's 
a realm of authority over everything that has been connected in your life to darkness and established. It establishes you in authority in the realms of power and love and a sound mind. And it calls you, it calls you into, so it's like, like where I say I'm called into ministry. Well, this is like, this is a calling where God calls you into order that you would operate from wisdom from dis- self-discipline, from soundness of mind, uh, from moderation, and from self-control. So that's what this means. When it, when it speaks about um, when they don't acknowledge God, they become futile in their thinking. It becomes confusion. The lines become blurred, and people slip. And how, how many times have we seen people that have loved God and doing really well slip back into the world because they have let go? of that relationship. They've let go of thanking God and praising him and giving him the glory for the things that are happening in their life, but taking it for themselves. Oh, look what I've done today. Look what I've achieved. So that we need that, that, that divine transfer, don't we? And receive that redemption from the darkness out of the confusion and keep being established in the realm of the kingdom of God. So number eight, you're chosen. You're chosen. Eclectos. Eclectos is that word. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. So why do we want to go back to having a futile mind and being confused and the lines blurred and messing up morally? We don't want to do that. We want to stay in the place of being chosen. We want to be in the place of being that royal priesthood. We want to be in the place of being that holy nation. Come on, God's special possession. I am God's special possession. You are God's special possession. Do you need to hear that today? There's so many people at the weekend we were in London. What did they need to hear? That they were chosen, that they were loved, that they were God's special possession. That, that's that's the core of sonship and daughtership, isn't it? You are his chosen, his special possession, the member of his household, a holy people, set apart, come on, redeemed, forgiven. 1 Peter 1 verse 4, or Colossians, yeah. Um, you are have inheritance. You have inheritance. You're chosen. You have inheritance. Colossians 1 verse 12, give joyful thanks joyful things it's not like oh god i just thank you today for like this lovely day and my house and thank you jesus thank you god it's a beautiful day thank you for the rain that makes the crops grow thank you that i've got a roof over my head there are millions that don't right now thank you for the food on my table there are millions that don't have it right now god i thank you for the blessings on my life for my children my grandchildren I thank you for my car. I thank you for the trees and nature. I thank you, Lord, that I am your chosen possession, that you picked me, that I'm your favorite, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, come on. Give joyful thanks to the Father who has what? Qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. He qualified you to share in the inheritance. The fact that you have inheritance has nothing to do with you. It's to do with the fact that he qualified you. He qualified you. He wrote your certificate of qualification. Not man, not what you've done. Jesus. Jesus wrote your certificate of qualification for your inheritance as a holy people in the kingdom of light. That is who you are. So it says in 1 Peter 4, in his great mercy, he, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Come on! It can never perish, spoil, or fade. The enemy can't take this away from you. The only person that can give this up is you. The only person that can change it is you. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. We want to have the inheritance of God, don't we? You are the inheritance you have inheritance and you are the inheritance matthew 25 verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right come come you who are blessed by my father take your inheritance the kingdom 
prepared for you since the creation of the world. Come and take it, you who are the blessed of my father. Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. And if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we will share in his glory. So we are co-heirs, heirs of God, heirs with Christ. We are children of God. And there's going to come a day when he says to those sitting on his right, because remember, you're already seated. You're already seated. And he's going to say to you sitting on his right, come, you're blessed by my father. Come and take your inheritance, the kingdom that is prepared for you since the creation of time. There's a kingdom and it's prepared for who? You. There's a kingdom prepared for you. And he's going to call you to come and take it. He's going to call you. It's going to come a day, guys. This is reality. This isn't just words in a book. This is freaking reality. He is going to say to you, get up off your chair, get up off your throne, sit into the right of me and come. And I'm going to give you your inheritance. I'm going to bless you with the inheritance that's stored up for you by my father. Number nine, you are forgiven. Hallelujah. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To, and that means that he is disregarded. He doesn't keep an account of it anymore. He neglects it. He chooses to not acknowledge it. It is gone. It is gone. So why do we keep digging it up? Why do we keep digging up that old skeleton in the closet? You know, it's gone. Bury the thing. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Do, 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 do. Yeah, let it go. Number 10, you belong to a priestly office. You belong to a priestly office. That word is he era tuma. He era tuma. And it means that you are a royal priest, that you're not just a priest in the kingdom. You work and operate in the office of a priest. You're not just the bellboy. You are already operating and positioned as in the office of a priest. That means that you have governmental authority. You have governmental authority. So you're royal priests unto God. Revelation 5.10 says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. We're not here to serve ourselves. We're here to serve the Lord. We're not here to build our kingdom. We're here to build his kingdom. Revelation 1.6, for he has made us, oh, sorry, Revelation uh, yeah, one six. for he has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever. So I think he was trying to get, when God says something once, we need to listen. When he says it twice, we need to really take notice. So Revelation 5.10, he says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests unto serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Revelation 1.6, for he has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Blessed and holy. Blessed and holy are you as the priests of the Lord. Lastly, Number 11, you belong to an eternal kingdom of sovereign rule. You belong to an eternal kingdom of sovereign rule. When something is eternal, it means it's never going to end. You're not, you don't belong to, a, you know, like our utility provider went pop, you know. You kind of assume they're going to be there forever, but they're not. They're temporal. Our homes are temporal. Our our our, our lives here are temporal, but there's going to come a day when we step into an eternal kingdom. We're already part of it. We're already seated in it. But there's going to come a day when the two become one. Woo! Colossians 1.13 says he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into what? The kingdom of the son he loves. That eternal kingdom. We're there and yet we're coming there, you know. Revelation eleven fifteen. 
the seventh angel sounded the seventh angel come on the little the last one and what did he say there was great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our god and of his christ and he shall reign forever there's going to come a day guys whoo, when we are there right with him ruling and reigning and there's going to be that moment when the kingdoms finally become the kingdoms of god not just one kingdom or two kingdoms or russia or ukraine or america or great Brit britain or india or africa not just one kingdom but all the kingdoms of the world there's going to come a moment when the seventh angel releases a sound releases a sound and when that sound is released it says the voices in heaven the great voices in heaven came together with that seventh angel and they began to shout out the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign he shall reign how long forever forever this world will not carry on as it is hallelujah come on it's not going to carry on as it is it's going to come a day when the angel signs that seventh trumpet and there's going to be a sign that is released and we're going to hear it and we're going to know it and the, there's going to be this shout that comes out of the heavenlies that unites with the shout on earth and it's going to be the kingdoms of this world are finally become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and you know what you know what we get to be there come on we get to be there it's going to be awesome and he shall reign forever and as the, as the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our god and of his christ then the preparation is becoming complete for the return of the kingdom of jerusalem for the new jerusalem to descend and who what is that that is when the father comes and is reunited with his family when the father comes back not just jesus which jesus is amazing and we're going to like be with him for the thousand years but then we get to be the father is going to come and we're going to get to be with the father and walk in the garden again just like adam and eve we're going to walk with him and talk with him and it's going to be amazing so let me just recap those points we've gone from being sinners to the redeemed and forgiven We've gone from being condemned to being loved and unpunishable. We have gone from being sinners to being holy. We've gone from being slaves to being sons and heirs. We've gone from being flesh beings onto spirit beings. We've gone from being strangers to God to being members of his household. We've gone from having a futile mind to having a sound mind, knowing who we are with clarity. We've gone from being lost to being chosen. You have inheritance. You are for, forgiven. You belong to a priestly office. And you belong to an eternal kingdom of sovereign rule. I bless this message to encourage you today to really press in to know him more, to go deeper with him, that the word of God may just resonate and flow with you in such a beautiful way. I bless it to go deep within you that will bring life to you, that will break off chains that hold you and set you free, that will bring joy to you, unspeakable and full of glory. Ooh. Release that upon you today. I bless you to know him and to know who you are, that the divine exchanges that you have had, there's so many more, these are just a few but to really take time today and thank him. Thank you, Lord, for the divine exchanges that have happened in my life. And I long to be part of that eternal kingdom and see the sovereign rule of God established on the earth. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the divine exchange, the great exchange. Thank you, Lord, that, that you see us through eternal eyes. Thank you for your word that that brings life. Thank you that we're, we don't stand under condemnation. Lord, we stand as, as free, free men before you, 
we stand as sons and daughters, priests, royal ambassadors. We carry authority and power that we don't deserve. We're chosen, we carry inheritance, and we're part of something eternal that is only going to get greater and greater. We bless you and adore you, Lord. We thank you for each one on here today, and we bless them with your grace. We bless them with your goodness, and I bless them with your favor. In Jesus' name, amen.